Thank you everyone today for joining for bringing lupus nephritis out of the shadows um, presented by Dr. Emily Little John, uh, who is with Arinia. Um, and thank you to our spon sponsors, Arinia and All In for Lupus. So please visit the Arinia website and All In for Lupus Nephritis. Um, for lupusnephritis.com. It is in the email I sent out and I will send out another email later on, but welcome Dr. Littlejohn. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. All set, can you see everything here that I'm seeing? Yes. Okay, great. I'm just gonna turn myself off, okay. Is it okay to start? Yes, go ahead. Great. Hello everyone, uh, whether you be in Texas or New York, I'm excited to be talking to you today. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Emily Littlejohn. I am a rheumatologist here at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, I am the co-director of the Lupus Clinic. I'm also the lucky recipient of an LFA award. So I'm happy to be speaking to some of my people. Uh, thank you for your support. And I'm here today to talk to you about lupus nephritis. And lupus nephritis, um, you know, this is a, a wide topic and I'm speaking to you on behalf of Arrhenia about lupus nephritis, but generally speaking, lupus nephritis is the one of the most devastating manifestation of systemic lupus. Um, so I think we should really start by taking a step back and saying, you know, what, what is lupus? And I get this question just about every day in my practice. And what I help patients is that, you know, lupus is probably born of a, a two hit process. So there is a genetic underlying tone, a familial, you know, predisposition that patients probably have. And then something happens, whether that be an exposure, maybe a virus, um, a hormone, an estrogen hormone, um, or uh, uh, an exposure to like a UVA or a UVB light, which is from you know the sun. Um, we don't know really what it is. But there's probably two hits. After that happens, the body stops recognizing itself as self, um, and essentially attacks itself um, in different areas. So you know when it attacks itself in the joints, we see patients coming with joint pain and joint stiffness and joint swelling. Uh, when it attacks itself on the skin, patients get uh, lupus on the skin, can happen in the heart and the lungs. And specifically in this case, when lupus attacks itself in the kidney, it's called lupus nephritis. And as you can see here on the right, um, about 50% of people living with lupus or systemic lupus will go on to, the, to develop lupus nephritis. So lupus nephritis uh, is a common complication of lupus, as I mentioned, um, and like I said, it's really when the body is attacking itself locally at the kidneys, and this causes inflammation and permanent damage. The kidneys then can stop functioning normally, uh, and what the kidneys do in the body is very important. They remove waste from the blood, they regulate the blood pressure, and they can regulate a lot of other hormones. So when the, there's local inflammation in the kidneys and the kidneys shut down, um, this is a very uh, dangerous state of being. So who's affected by lupus nephritis? And let me just mention that every picture uh, in this PowerPoint, uh, these are all photos of real people living with lupus nephritis. But before we talk about lupus nephritis, uh, who does lupus affect in general? And lupus typically affects women of childbearing age. So women from ages 16 to 45, um, affects women more to men in a nine to one fashion. So women are nine times more likely to have lupus than men. And it typically affects women um, of black, Hispanic or Asian Pacific Islander background. So what about lupus nephritis? Well, lupus nephritis is not as uncommon as you might think. There are about 100,000 people in the US who are currently diagnosed and living with lupus nephritis. About one in three are diagnosed with lupus nephritis at the time of their systemic lupus diagnosis. So a third of patients at the time of their lupus diagnosis have kidney involvement of their lupus. Similarly to systemic lupus, as you see on the right, um, compared to white people, the prevalence of lupus nephritis is about four times higher in people of African or Asian descent, and about two times higher for Hispanics and Native American people. As I mentioned, lupus typically happens in women, but in lupus nephritis, um, although it is more common in women, um, men are often affected more severely by the disease. So what are some signs and symptoms of lupus nephritis? Well, you know, what I tell my patients is if they ever have a question, if they're concerned that any symptom or any feeling that they're having is a, a reflection of lupus nephritis, to just let me know. I typically see patients every three to six months who have active disease. So in general, if there is a question of a sign or symptom that you are unsure of, 
um, always ask your physician. But generally speaking, this is what we tell patients. Big potential symptoms of lupus nephritis include swelling, usually in the lower extremities, so the feet, uh, the legs, or the ankles. Weight gain, and this is typically from uh, the fluid accumulation. Increased urination, especially at night. Uh, patients say that they're waking up uh, multiple times in the middle of the night to use the restroom. And foamy, bubbly, or frothy urine. And patients will describe this sort of like beer. They say their, their urine is bubbly and frothy and kind of looks like a, a, a beer. Um, so the question is, why does this happen? Well, really what's happening in lupus nephritis is because there's so much inflammation in the kidney, there's leakage of protein into the urine, which is called proteinuria. Oops. There's leakage of blood into the urine that's called hematuria. That's why it has a little bit of a pink tinged color. We can see abnormal electrolyte levels in the blood. So patients, you know, their typical blood work, their basic blood work is a little bit abnormal. And in the blood work, you can see a decrease in their their kidney functioning, which is called the glomerular filtration rate or the GFR. Um, another marker for kidney function is the creatinine, which is typically elevated in patients who have lupus nephritis. As I mentioned, the kidneys regulate blood pressure. So when there's issues with the kidneys, the blood pressure will be out of control. It can be very, very high or unregulated. And lastly, sometimes we can see on ultrasound or some images of the kidneys that they're a little bit smaller or shrunken or scarred. So what are some complications related to lupus nephritis? And as you can imagine, because the kidneys do so many things, uh, there are a lot of complications that can be related to this disease. The first one is increased blood pressure, as I mentioned. I usually have patients take their blood pressure two times a week and consistently at the same time every week and record it for me. This way we can, um, we can identify small fluctuations in blood pressure. One other, another complication is chronic kidney disease. So sometimes if there's too much inflammation, this can lead to scarring. Some patients require dialysis, which is really the end stage uh, version of kidney disease. A lot of patients can develop cardiovascular complications. The kidneys and the heart are very, um, very uh, intertwined in how they work. Most patients in our clinic here at the Cleveland Clinic will be seen by the cardiologists uh, once they have a diagnosis of lupus nephritis, just to keep an eye on things and for preventative measures. And lastly, as I mentioned, um, patients can go on to uh, develop kidney failure, what's known as ESRD or end-stage renal disease. The big takeaway from this slide is that there's a lot of complications from lupus nephritis, and uh, this really just kind of underscores why we need to catch this disease early. So it leads us to the next point. How then do we diagnose lupus nephritis? Well, the question is sort of who diagnoses lupus nephritis? And I think there are a few different physicians who can do this. Um, most typically though, lupus nephritis is diagnosed by a rheumatologist or a nephrologist. And the difference uh, really of these two physicians, you know, we work very closely together. I'm a rheumatologist. I see all different types of lupus. I see lupus in the joints, in the skin, in the heart, in the lungs. Everyone's lupus is different. Um, when I see patients who have lupus in the kidney specifically, I manage it, but I absolutely will refer them to a nephrologist. And a nephrologist just deals with lupus in the kidney. Uh, these specialists will not only keep an eye on the kidney functioning, but they are the ones who will physically do the kidney biopsy, which is the way that we diagnose the lupus. After the biopsy and after the diagnosis is established, the nephrologist still works alongside us here in rheumatology uh, to help manage this disease. So what are some tests to help diagnose lupus nephritis? Well, the urine test is probably the most valuable. At every visit with our lupus patients, we have them um, give us a little sample of urine and we will check the urine for different types of proteins and different types of blood. Uh, and we can kind of quantify how much they're spilling into the urine. The next test is the blood test. So typically when we get lupus labs, we'll also get, obtain the blood tests. And this measures the creatinine and the glomerular filtration rate, which is a function of the kidney. Uh, and it also reflects how well the kidneys are working. And lastly, the kidney biopsy. So this is really the gold standard. This is the way that we say, absolutely, yes, there is lupus in the kidney or absolutely no, there is no lupus in the kidney. The urine and the blood give us um, good hints and are very good tools to lead into this diagnosis, but the biopsy is really the, the more definitive way. So let's talk now about specifically the diagnosis uh, based on the kidney biopsy. 
So first I'll say that uh, there are six different classes of lupus nephritis. Not all of them are created equal. So you see there's class one to class six. The ones that we are the most aggressive with are class three and class four. So class one is called minimal mesangial glomerular nephritis, which is a very long name. It's very hard to say. Basically what this means is there's minimal kidney involvement. Class two, as you see down here, um, is mesangial proliferative glomerular nephritis. And there's some evidence of inflammation. The inflammation is sort of just spilling into the rest of the kidney at that point. Class three, which is focal glomerular nephritis, uh, is when there is involvement of less than half of the network of small blood vessels in the kidneys. And this is a very serious class. At this point, we, we treat this very seriously and treat it very um, aggressively. Class four is diffuse proliferative nephritis. Again, uh, this is another diagnosis that we take very seriously and treat very aggressively. And the difference between class three and class four is that half them point. So class three, there's involvement of less than half of these very important vessels. And in class four, there's more than half of these very important vessels. Class five is called membranous glomerular nephritis. And this is characterized by immune deposits that are in different areas of um, the, the vessels in the kidney. And then there's class six, which is really kind of a, a scarring, what's called sclerotic um, form of lupus nephritis. We don't typically treat class five and class six very aggressively. Another thing I will mention at this point is that um, a biopsy can change throughout your life. So there are often times when patients get a biopsy and they're treated for a certain class, but they're either not responsive or we're, you know, we're suspicious that things are changing and we'll actually re-biopsy patients. You can have mostly class three with some features of class five, uh, mostly class four with some features, uh, features of class six. So there's kind of a spectrum here of um, how many classes we can see on the biopsy. So how do we then manage lupus nephritis? Well, treatment is vital, uh, but taking an active role in your care will help you get the most out of your management. So the first thing that you can do is really work with your healthcare provider, know them well, go to your appointments, be compliant, have open discussions, do your part in learning. So learn about what kind of lupus you have, what your lupus fingerprint is, what class of uh, lupus nephritis do you have and how do we best treat it? Next, you can focus on diet and exercise, which are all very important uh, parts of the management of this disease and general healthy living measures. So I mentioned before that a nephrologist and a rheumatologist work very closely together, but that's really sort of just the tip of the iceberg. Some other potential members of lupus um, and lupus nephritis um, healthcare teams include the rheumatologist, the nephrologist, your primary care provider, who really is the gateway person. So I, oftentimes I have patients when they are concerned about a new symptom uh, or they're concerned about a new rash or a new cough and they're, you know, they're not really sure if it's from lupus or not. I have them see their primary care provider first and then we'll try to get them in to be seen by me as quickly as possible. A dietitian and a nutritionist are very important. Most of my patients get referred to one of them uh, just for help and some tips about healthy living and healthy eating choices. A psychologist is also very important, whether that be a therapist or a, um, a psychiatrist to help with medications. You know, I think during COVID especially, but generally in these conditions that are chronic, we see a lot of mental health issues that oftentimes we don't talk enough about. Some other potential healthcare providers include the dermatologist, especially when patients have, you know, rashes that we're not sure if they're lupus or not, I might send them for a biopsy. A neurologist, who is a physician who can help uh, for suspecting lupus in the brain or lupus in the spinal cord. Certainly a cardiologist as lupus can affect the valves of the heart and these other physicians here, radiologists, pharmacists, and physical therapists. So working with your healthcare team, here are a few tips on this slide for being your best self-advocate. Number one, keep track of your medical appointments and hospital visits. Uh, the MyChart portal or the portals that we use now with the electronic health records are uh, very helpful in doing this. The second one is writing down your symptoms over time. I love when patients come in and they have a little calendar for me and they say, these are the three days that I didn't feel well. And I'll say, well, let's see what was going on these three days. And I ask them, did you eat something differently? Did you miss a medication? Were you outside exposed to the sun? As we know, the sun can flare lupus. So it's really great to have a time frame and sort of a timestamp of the chronological order that things are happening. I love when patients organize recent results of blood work or lab tests, they come in and they bring me old reports or old records from an urgent care visit or another emergency room visit, um, records specifically that I can't see, I think it's very helpful. When patients bring a list of all their meds in, that's also very helpful. 
or even better yet, bring the medications in, bring them in a bag for me to see so I can say what you're taking, what doses, how often, those types of things. If possible, bring a, a friend or a family member to your appointment. COVID has kind of put a damper on that. And lastly, ask any questions that you have. There's really no dumb question. In fact, write them down and come with a list of questions. A few telemedicine tips in the time of COVID. Um, this remote, this remote uh, visit uh, telemedicine is becoming hot and probably won't be going away anytime soon. So like I mentioned, have questions ready for me. Uh, are you a physician? You know, write them down. And again, there is no question that's, that's too small. Ensure that you have reliable internet connection. That's also very important. You know, time is, time is precious. So those 30 minutes or those 15 minutes of an appointment, you wanna get the most out of them. Use the chat feature. So, you know, if, if I have a poor connection or the patient can't hear me, I can always just chat them and say, I'm gonna give you a call at this number or call the office and we can reschedule. Wearing the right clothing is very important as well, especially as a rheumatologist, when we like to see the different areas where, where there's a rash or there's new swelling or there's an oral ulcer or there's you know, new hair loss or a patchy hair loss. Um, it's really important for me to be able to see that as, as well as I can virtually. Uh, and lastly, as I mentioned, um, if you can check your vitals ahead of time. So typically patients who have lupus nephritis, we ask them to keep, it, keep track of their blood pressures. If you can write those down, you know, twice a week, I think is appropriate, different times of the day, but consistently the same time twice a week um, and just have a running list of those numbers. So what are some commonly used treatments for lupus nephritis? And this is sort of a hot topic. We have a, a few new drugs that have come out just in the last year here. The first one uh, and the probably most potent one are the immunosuppressants. So these are used to treat that class three or class four, uh, the most aggressive uh, medications that we have to treat severe lupus nephritis. These can be oral or they can be infusions. The next class are steroids, which I'm sure most of you watching are, are familiar with. Steroids such as prednisone or Medrol make you feel great. You know, they work quickly, they're very potent, but they have a lot of bad side effects. And in fact, some lupus specialists call them poison because over time they really do affect all the organs and are associated with a lot of organ damage. The next one are blood pressure medications. Like I mentioned, the kidneys regulate the blood pressure and typically in lupus nephritis, patients' blood pressures, pressures are too high. We use a lot of different medications like ACE inhibitors, if you might recognize that name, uh, just things to keep the blood pressure under control. And the last and probably most important in my opinion are the anti-malarials. These are things like hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine. And these are medications that really all patients with any kind of lupus are on as a, as a first step. This is really you know, the medication that we know that can prolong your life and prevent organ involvement in lupus. Um, these medications are not toxic, they're not immunosuppressive um, and they should be taken pretty much every day. So how about things beyond medications? Uh, these things include diet and exercise and other healthy living uh, tips. So eating right for your kidneys is very important. You now a proper diet can help manage kidney disease and lower your blood pressure, specifically those uh, foods that have less salt or are low sodium. Avoiding processed foods is very important. Uh, eating small portions of protein rich foods like chicken and fish, those lean proteins. Choosing heart healthy foods like fruits and vegetables. And a few other questions that I get all the time are, you know, what is the one thing that I can eliminate or what should I be eliminating in terms of continuing an anti-inflammatory diet? And there's really no silver bullet here, but I, I do think patients who can avoid sugar uh, tend to do much better. Uh, there's a question of gluten as well. You know, patients who have a gluten sensitivity or who have celiac disease should certainly avoid gluten. But even those who don't, uh, they, they feel like they, they feel better when they um, avoid gluten rich foods. So that's something to consider. The last thing I'll mention here is the question of nightshades, so peppers and eggplants. There is some information going around the lupus community that these medications might be harmful to lupus or flare lupus. Um, there's not a lot of evidence uh, just to show that is true. However, if you avoid those foods and you feel better, by all means, continue to avoid them. And as always, exercise is always better. So consider adding exercise to your routine. Um, exercise can enhance both uh, physical and mental health. Um, it can strengthen your bones and muscles without aggravating inflamed joints, specifically if we use low impact exercise. So these things include walking, swimming, yoga, even deep breathing, meditation techniques, uh, an elliptical machine. 
And as always, you should consult your doctor before you start any of these new programs. And as I mentioned, you really are your own best advocate. So we need to be engaged and stay informed at every step of the way. Um, you know, I would advise everyone here to learn about lupus nephritis, learn about your lupus fingerprint, you know, how your lupus was diagnosed, uh, learn about what features of lupus that you, you specifically have and how you can best manage those features. Like I mentioned, it's very important to understand your risk. Uh, those who have lupus, 50% of them will go on to have lupus nephritis or lupus in the kidney. And know what to look for. So know exactly what your lupus flares feel like. So some patients come in and they know exactly when their lupus is flaring. They have the exact symptoms that they've had for the past 15 years when they've had lupus flares. And that's important to, for me to know that because I can believe them, you know, I, I can say, okay, your lupus is flaring. That's, this is your, this is how your lupus is manifesting. We then can go on and, and make a treatment plan together. Uh, discuss your options. So again, there's really no one size fits all treatment. Everyone's lupus is different and everyone's lupus treatment is different. Some medications work better for one person that won't work for another. Uh, and this is also true for lupus nephritis treatments. Continue to learn. So engage this all in and lupus nephritis community uh, nationally and locally at your level, um, inform your friends and your family. And I would really urge them to all be in, involved in your lupus journey. Some other resources that are, I think are really great um, so that you can feel informed and, and supported and involved. You can visit this all in website that you can see here. So you can check out all in Facebook community, which is a great resource for patients. Uh, and you can sign up for the lupus nephritis awareness kit which is the website that you can see here. Uh, as always, the LFA is a great resource um, along with Arinia. Uh, and this presentation was brought to you by Arinia. Uh, together we can raise awareness and offer support and there is strength in community. I am happy to take any questions at this time. Um, and thank you for letting me talk to you today. All right, so if anyone has any questions, you can either take yourself off mute or you can drop it in um, the chat box and we can get going. Um, but I do have a question is, do you know why it's more common, why lupus is more common in African-Americans? Um, no, we have some ideas. There's no, there's no kind of final word on that. Um, again, it's, there's some genetic uh, commonalities among African-American women, uh, but it might be a mix of genetics and also exposures or the way that our bodies react to hormones. Okay, and then if I see my doctor for my SLE, will they automatically check for my for kidney issues with all or most of the visits if they Absolutely. haven't already been diagnosed? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then is there a specific diet to follow or foods to avoid if you have lupus nephritis? Um, I would suggest a referral to a dietitian specifically because it depends on kind of where you're starting, what your baseline is, you know, how high your blood pressures are, what your weight is. Uh, generally speaking, we say low sodium and some patients need to be careful about how much fluid they take in. So, you know, heart healthy is what we tell everyone. I think low sodium is very important. Um, and eat the rainbow, a lot of fruits and veggies and colorful things, avoiding, you know, too much salt or, uh, too many, uh, refined foods is probably the most important. Okay. And then how common is it for someone in their eighties to be diagnosed with lupus nephritis? I think it depends on two things. Um, so if you've had long-standing lupus uh, and it's been active for a while, your chances are probably higher. But if you have a new diagnosis of lupus in your 80s, uh, I think the chance that you're gonna be diagnosed and go on to get lupus nephritis is much lower. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. And then if someone has a higher class of lupus nephritis, is there a way to reverse the damage that has been done? That's a good question. Um, so the number doesn't mean you have a higher you have more activity. So one to six, six is not, you have more activity than one. Um, like I mentioned before, three and four are the most active types. Uh, and really you can, I think you can preserve what you have and the goal is to reverse. So if you can catch it early and you can be aggressive with the, the treatment plan, then you can you know, probably do a good job reversing. If it goes too long and there's too much scarring or too much damage, then unfortunately it can't be reversed. Okay. And then what are natural ways to treat without hazards of steroids? Uh, well, the anti-malarials, so plaquenil and hydroxychloroquine or uh, chloroquine, 
those are not immunosuppressive and those are what's called steroid sparing. So they prevent you from having to be on steroids. And that's kind of also the goal of the immunosuppressive medications. So using those in place of having to put patients on steroids long-term. Usually steroids are more of a temporizing measure. They're necessary, uh, but the, the thought is we should use them in the lowest doses for as little as possible. Um, that's the safest, the safest thing to do. Okay. And then I know that you said a biopsy is the way that lupus nephritis is diagnosed, but is there a range of the results from the urine test that may give an indication that lupus nephritis may be de developing? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually there's a lot of research going on in that, um, in that regard. Um, there is a, a rough estimation of how much protein you're spilling to what class we think you probably have, but yeah, it's a little bit deceiving because some patients might not be spilling a lot of protein or might have a lower amount of protein, but their biopsy actually shows that they have very severe lupus. So it's not a perfect science. Um, it just gives you kind of an indication of where they might be. Right. And then is a biopsy done in the office or how long does it take? What does that include? Yeah, so the biopsy is what's called an outpatient procedure. So it's one day. Um, the nephrologist will take you in to like a sterile suite and they just do it kind of in, in the suite. Um, I believe it takes about an hour. Um, I think they probably watch you before, they get it all set up, they do the biopsy and then they, they let you go home. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any other questions before we go? This was really good. Well, if not, Thank you so much, Dr. Littlejohn, for coming on and speaking about lupus nephritis. Um, and I do encourage everyone to visit allinforlupusnephritis.com or even visit their Facebook page, All In for LN um, is their uh, name on Facebook. You can always find it in um, on our weeks. We, uh, what is it called? Tag them in our post too. So go to our <laughs> Facebook page and see the, the tags that we tagged them in. Uh, but definitely visit their website, find tips and tools on there that can help you with your lupus nephritis, or if you know someone, um, gear them towards that website. And you can always reach out to us. We have information and physician referral lists that we have and community resources if you need help finding resources. Again, thank you, Dr. Little John. Thank you, Arinia. Thank you um, all in for lupusnephritis.com. And everyone have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Bye-bye. Sorry, how are we able to access these slides? If, if I wanted to access these slides to look at them later, how would I be able to do that? Uh, let me see if I can get permission to send them to you. And if I can, I'll send them. Um, if not, this video is being recorded. And so you can go and rewatch it after I get it posted. Yeah, that's what I meant. How can I access the recording? Yeah. Is it going to be, is it going to be reposted today?